Well, hello, everyone. It's That Williams Guy back for another episode, and this is another gathering of the nerds as I'm joined by John Hearn and Eric Gelhouse. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different of a show tonight because Eric is actually joining us from the road, uh, calling him by cell phone. So uh, you won't see any video clips of him if you're watching the YouTube. You'll see a wonderful little phone icon. And so you also hear some road noise and stuff in the background. But uh, Eric, say hello to everybody. Good evening, everyone. All right. Briefly tell them who you are. So Eric Gellhouse, uh, retired cop from out in Northern California. Uh, now I'm back to being a gun writer. I do a little bit of teaching. Yeah, did the academic thing a little bit. That's kind of it. All right. And you also just got a new position as the editor of a magazine, correct? Yeah, so back in January, I became the editor for American Cop Magazine. Uh, it's online only. Uh, it's one of the firearms media group publications. So it's there with guns, uh, American handgunner, and shooting industry. Yeah, I saw an uh, article that was put out in your magazine this week, and it uh, had references to some guy named John Hearn. It did. It did. We lowered our standards and uh, <laughs> went and did some mindset and human factors issues. So it's <laughs> Did an article on John's classes. Um, you know, it's difficult to get to four science. That's a week long class. It's difficult to get to some other of the good human factors training. But John has distilled the significant stuff out of all of those classes into an eight hour presentation, along with some other stuff that I think is is relevant to the defensive shooter um, or the working cop who's concerned about their performance under fire. And so we kind of tried to address some of that in the article. All right, then. Speaking of lowered standards, John, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to let Eric keep talking about how wonderful I am. I know you won't do that, Lee, but Eric apparently certainly will, and we'll even put it in print. But, uh, yeah, I'm John Hearn, uh, currently serving law enforcement officer somewhere in the Deep South. Uh, been on the job, started part-time, 92, full-time since 2000. Uh, kind of dual career track, uh, working the law enforcement gig, also have a background in some formal education research. Uh, been researching, presenting on various topics related to the self-defense world since about 2005. Uh, range Master Staff Instructor Thompson putting up with me since about 2000. Uh, I've, I just stopped doing the math. Everybody else has to do the math for how those numbers work out. But I, I've been around for a little bit, seen a few things, uh, occasionally uh, stumble upon a gym to share. All right. Well, this episode is going to take a little bit of a different path from the evolution of training history. We're going to talk about significant events and how they have impacted uh, either training or certain takeaways that, have, that, that we should all care from those incidents. Now, most of these are going to be law enforcement instances, but perhaps there are some, some private sector uh, takeaways as well. Uh, the first of those instances we're going to talk about is the onion field. Um, this was an incident that took place, I believe, in 1963, uh, was written about in a book by Joseph Wambaugh, and then was later turned into a movie in which a young Ted Danson played one of the uh, detectives involved in the case. And basically, this involved uh, two plainclothes detectives that made a traffic stop and uh, well, made a stop on a car. And basically, bad stuff ensued. So, John, if you would take it over from there. Uh, my, my understanding is, is that one of the suspects got a drop on one of the other officers and took his weapon. Uh, basically, had a revolver screwed into the small of the back of the other officer. And the officer told his partner, hey, he's got my gun. He's got a gun in my back. You need to give him your gun. So both officers uh, surrendered their weapons, were driven some distance out of Los Angeles, and then taken to an onion field. And one of the officers was shot in the back of the head. Uh, the other officer was able to escape and flee on foot. Uh, you know, the guys eventually ended up in prison, but it was way too late for the officers. Yeah, Eric, you got anything to add to the synopsis? Uh, I remember right from the exhibit at the LA Police uh, Museum, there was there not just a gunshot to the back of the head, there were additional rounds fired. Not that it would have changed the outcome, but I think there was more than one round fired into the, the deceased officer, the murdered officer. Okay. And our takeaways here are multiple. 
So Johnny said the first one involved not giving up your guns. Yeah, there's a, a situation, um, you know, some of the FBI research indicates the same thing of what do you do when you're facing a drawn gun? You know, it's not that the kind of hero scenario that we like to think about. It's a, it's a pretty bad situation. And having some kind of solution to that in the back of your head is going to be important. And I think it's also, you know, to a certain degree of mindset, you know, we now know that giving up your gun does not turn out well. So, you know, uh, having expectations about what your partners are going to do, um, whatever you can do to facilitate what your partners need to do, it's going to be very, very important. So, you know, not giving up your gun, uh, not surrendering that way is, is the first big takeaway from that event. All right. And then our and second with, big, go ahead, Eric. I would just say along with that is both weapon retention and disarming training, right? And, and I get that not all the, the training on that out there has been proven out for real, but having something to work off of, as John said, having a plan, having the mindset to carry it out, inclusion is, is going to be significant. All right, and John, the other point you raised would be carrying a backup weapon. Yeah, I think that was one of the, you know, this was one of the uh, cases that, you know, the, the event itself happened in 63, but the book was published in 73. And that was right at the beginning of the, the officer safety movement really, really getting, gaining steam, you know, after New Hall in 1970. So, you know, the, the need to carry a backup gun, especially, you know, back in the day when, you know, you've got a revolver, you've got the six in the gun, plus, you know, something in a drop pouch, um, reloads were, you know, insufferably long in that situation. So having a second gun to go to uh, was definitely seen as, as a smart option back in the day. Uh, sadly, I don't see as many guys carrying backup guns as they used to. And I think it's because we, we've gotten spoiled the high capacity nine millimeters. Uh, we just don't ever assume that, you know, the gun might be there as a, for a worst case scenario as a, uh, a, a life preserver when the uh, lifeboat is failed. Uh, Eric, any thoughts on that? Uh, continuing down, down the backup gun road, there are still agencies that, that if not frowning on backup guns, outright discourage and forbid them by policy. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why. You'd have a situation where an officer takes a catastrophic injury to their shooting hand. They may not be able to get access to the, prim the primary pistol, the only pistol at that point, if they don't have a secondary handgun on them. Maybe the situation where you have to arm another officer, um, an off-duty officer with it, which has been discussed by our friend Chuck Haggard and some others. There, have a policy where you have to have make, bottle, serial number, and caliber of the backup gun on file, and you train with it, and you qualify with it. It takes away the argument that a second gun is a drop gun. Um, and puts it into a life, piece of life-saving equipment that's no different than anything else. It's analogous to the airbags to a seatbelt. Yeah, the, so the first aid. Encourage, they should... Go ahead, Eric. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I, was, I was just going to say that they should be encouraged, not discouraged. They should probably be issued as well. Yeah, the agency that I started with did not allow backup weapons, and I don't think that policy has changed there. Um, one yeah, thought that I, for the life of me, understand. Go ahead. Uh, one thought that came to mind, another takeaway with this is, you know, the old saying, never get taken to crime scene number two. Yeah, that, that was, I meant to mention that there's several crime scene number twos in these instances we're going to discuss. And, you know, the onion field and the event in Memphis, uh, that we'll save for a later show definitely shows the perils of being taken to the second crime scene. Uh, you know, that second crime scene basically allows them to take their time. Um, and do as they will with you. Uh, and that, that never works out well for whether it's an officer or just a standard crime victim. You know, going to that second crime scene is never good. Yeah, our mutual friend Claude Warner has a T-shirt that's the caption on the T-shirt says, when they go for the duct tape, it's time to make your move. And, you know, while you are definitely behind the curve if you're facing a drawn gun, if it's fight right there or be taken hostages and taken somewhere else, I would think your chances are going to be better off fighting right there. Even, even in the adverse yeah. situations we're already facing the gun, drawn gun. Uh, John. It's a, yeah. it's, it's not a, a pretty option, but you have to remember there are worse ways to die than getting shot in the back of the head. Um, that horrible um, home invasion kidnapping up in Connecticut with a doctor's wife, 
uh, where all the daughters were raped and literally burned alive. I mean, once you are duct taped, you don't have any say whatsoever. I can remember our friend William April, I was just actually watching a video from him from back, I think in 2005, talking about having those hard lines in the sand, you know, not going to the second crime scene. I said also the other thing that he would never do is never kneel on his knees. Uh, that was another, you know, seems to be a very popular execution position. You know, if somebody tells you to get down on your knees, um, there's probably an 80% chance that what follows is not going to be to your liking, but it won't be to your liking for not very long. Eric? You know, it's been, John's last comment just reminded me of a, of a deputy I worked with who was murdered early in my career, and yeah, getting down on your knees is, no, not a good thing. Secondary yeah. crime scene is not a good thing. Yeah. Any closing thoughts on uh, Nimfield's, John? Well, I was going to, you know, uh, we mentioned this earlier. We just, I think, talk about it real quick because I think that, you know, hopefully people are, some of the people listening to this are active duty law enforcement. I think that it's important to understand the history and where these things, uh, these lessons are coming from. So um, the detective that handled the Onionfield murders would go on to write a book called Officer Down Code 3. That book was published in 1976. And it was one of the first attempts to really uh, codify officer safety information. So that was published in 76. Uh, there was a series of books that uh, you know, Chuck Remsberg co-authored that came out starting, I think, 80. So um, you know, one of my, uh, to bunny show here for a second, you know, one of my favorite far side cartoons are these cavemen standing there with spears. And there's a mammoth on the ground with his feet sticking straight up in the air and like the spears hit the magic spot. And, they say to each other, we've got to remember that spot. And that's an example of a great win, right? You know, that we want to do that every time we can. Well, there's also these alternatives of these really, really bad lessons that we learn horribly from. So I, I, while it's tragic to lose officers, it's tragic to lose officers in the same way again and again. And it's interesting to mention, because uh, I think Eric has some information here, when we talk about Brooks being the detective that did this. Uh, when you look at the original book, he talks about, well, this is a list of 10 lessons we've learned but it goes back to an older lecture, right? So that, you know, there's a, uh, the 10 deadly sins of law enforcement, I think is what it's called. Uh, you can Google it, find it pretty easily. Um, we know that the book was published in 76. It probably goes back to possibly as early as the fifties. And if you were to read that list today and see why officers are dying, it's absolutely tragic to me that the, the same mistakes continue to be made on a, on a dishearteningly ready, regular basis. Yeah, Eric, you had some information about the one of the people that were involved in the incident, one of the detectives. So before I get to that, one of the other lessons is, granted, that the, the, office, the LAPD officers involved in this, my understanding, did not have communications equipment. So they couldn't put out the nature of the activity or the location that they were where they were at. However, we've got radios. We've got MDCs. We've got cell phones. We've got a whole bunch of ways for officers to get in contact with dispatch. And yet, as we discussed, in kind of before we hit the record button, we all still know officers who will initiate activity without telling dispatch what they're doing or where they're at or who they're doing it with. And that is an unacceptable course of action, not only you know, from a policy perspective, right, and, and potential at, you know, personnel investigations going forward, but on just on the officer survival perspective. And I can I could regrettably think of a coworker who regularly did that. And the first indication we as supervisors or as coworkers would have if he was involved in anything was a struggle. Right, you broke supervisors. Up. Right, Eric, you broke okay, up at sorry. the first indication. Uh, the first indication we had that he was doing anything was when he was on the radio screaming because he struggle with somebody. Yeah. All right, you still it's there? Uh, going on, the next thing was, my understanding, and I'm, I don't have the complete information on this, but the, the surviving officer of the Onion Field murder was then sent around to stations and briefings to discuss the event. And if I recall correctly from my visit to the museum and some other things I've read since, that it was not necessarily done purely as a training presentation, but that it might have been done 
at least partially maybe to shame the officer or to punish him for the outcome of the event. I would hope that, that agencies are doing a better job dealing with folks in the aftermath of a critical incident, especially something where one's partner was murdered, uh, than putting him in that kind of situation. So those, those are my two thoughts there. As for the Brooks book on Officer Down Code 3, the fatal errors listed in that are as valid today and as meaningful today as they were then. And I apologize, I've been on the road all day, so I don't have some of these things in hand like I would like to. Sure. All right, we'll move on to the next incident, which is what I think is probably the most pivotal uh, incident in the so-called officer survival movement. Uh, that that launched out of this era that we're dealing with, late 60s, early 70s. And uh, that's going to be the Newhall incident, sometimes referred to as the Newhall Massacre. And this was four California Highway Patrol officers uh, that uh, got into a shootout with two armed suspects. And the aftermath of this incident completely changed how firearms training was done within that agency. And then that's kind of spread uh, across the country. And uh, John, I know you've done Maybe. a lot of, what's that? Maybe, because it turns out there's some mythology out there that yeah. wasn't completely accurate. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, John, you have done extensive research into this incident, so I'm going to turn it over to you to give a good overview of it. Okay, so I think you don't want the two hour version of the, <laughs> the presentation. No, I want to go to bed in a little while, so go ahead. Okay, so, uh, uh, April of 1970, uh, there's a call for somebody brandishing a firearm, or basically a confrontation with an aggravated motorist uh, along what is the I-5 corridor. Um, they provide a suspect uh, vehicle description as well as literally the tag off the car. So uh, further on down the line, uh, two California Highway Patrol officers see the vehicle. Uh, they radio ahead, hey, we found the car. It looks like it's occupied by two clean cut males, which, you know, was kind of significant because at least they weren't dirty hippies, which was, you know, a concern in the 70s. Um, the, the officers make a plan. They're going to um, wait till the vehicle passes, uh, like basically the second exit down, and they'll all stop the car together. Um, the car decides to exit earlier. The, uh, the car that was behind it lights the car up uh, while the other officers are headed that way, tries to stop it. It does not yield immediately. It pulls into uh, a parking lot of a combination gas station diner. And one thing that's weird about Newhall is that the diner was filled with a church group and you know, their bus is literally parked outside. And they're watching, you know, this fight is witnessed very heavily because it literally takes place in front of, you know, probably scores of witnesses. So the, uh, you know, the vehicle comes to rest. The, the suspects are very hard or hardcore criminals. You know, one's a legit sociopath, one's a legit psychopath. Uh, they both killed people, um, you know, served time in some of the worst prisons in the country. Uh, they, they literally are the worst of the worst. Um, you know, amazingly, the suspects stop their car right at a point that channelizes the officer's movement where they're limited by ditches. Um, the officers approach, or obviously officers exit the vehicle, give a bunch of commands to the, uh, the, uh, the bad guys in the car. They don't immediately respond. Uh, the driver eventually gets out, assumes a handcuffing or a searching position on the trunk without being prompted, which is a pretty good clue. Uh, the officers go ahead and approach. Uh, the officers aren't covering each other. Uh, the other officer who's in the passenger seat has an 870. Uh, he goes to deal with the passenger of the car. Uh, he's got the 870 in one hand, reaches down with his left hand to open up the door. Uh, when the door is open, he gets shot immediately. And that's the, the, the start of the festivities, for lack of better words. Uh, the first officer goes down immediately. Uh, the officer that was searching the bad guy on the trunk goes to engage the other, uh, the, you know, the bad guy that just shot his partner. Uh, while he's doing that, the bad guy he was searching moves off to his side, shoots him twice, uh, bullets transecting laterally across the body. Uh, never good combination. He dies right there. Uh, the second unit that they were supposed to be making the traffic stop with is literally arriving on scene while the shots are being fired. They get out a radio call. Uh, they deploy, again, deploying a shotgun and a revolver. Uh, they have a little bit longer time in the fight. Uh, basically, the officer with the shotgun mismanipulates it, leaves an unfired round of double off buck laying on the uh, parking lot. Um, the uh, officer with the shotgun uh, shoots the car a lot, barely, uh, hits one of the bad guys with a single pellet of double lot buck. Um, he gets uh, shot repeatedly with double lot buck himself. Uh, one of the things that I, I love about Newhall is that there's literally a uh, civilian witness driving by that sees all this going on. 
Uh, he's a former Marine and decides to interject himself into the fight. So he actually picks up the officer's gun, attempts to engage the bad guy. Uh, unfortunately, the, the gun, he gets one shot off, wounds the suspect with some frag before he realizes the gun is empty. Uh, in the meantime, the, uh, the other bad guy and the other officer are exchanging shots in a, in a heated exchange. Um, the officer at the back of a car fires six rounds, misses all six. The bad guy fires four rounds, hits the officer with three of the four. Um, the officer at this point is empty, so he drops down behind his patrol car. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't do so in a way that let him know the bad guy was approaching. So he's struggling to reload his revolver from dump pouches, gets six rounds in the gun, uh, gets the cylinder closed just in time to realize the bad guy standing over him, at which point the bad guy shoots him one time in the head with a 45, uh, killing him instantly and leaving him dead. So at the, uh, the end of the exchange on the parking lot, four officers are already dead. Uh, a second, I'm sorry, a third uh, car of California Highway Patrolman arrive on the scene, exchange additional shots with the suspects, driving them off. Uh, manhunt ensues, and there's actually another uh, shooting involving an armed citizen in the middle of that as well. Uh, one of the bad guys ends up committing suicide, and the other guy goes to prison for a very long time. And he was actually uh, interviewed. Uh, actually, both bad guys were interviewed before they died. So we know a lot about the bad guys, what they were thinking, um, you know, the whole thought process that was going on with them. So it's a, it's a very, very rich uh, incident to dive into. And it's, I, I use it as a case study just because there's so much information available about it. Uh, just literally book after book has been written uh, on it. So you can, you can get a lot of information out of that fight and understand the actors probably better than you can in most fights. So that's, uh, that's New Holland probably way too longer than you want it. <laughs> now, you said both individuals were interviewed. Now, there was a hostage standoff at some point in time and a phone interview was conducted. With the it was a, a phone interview yeah. with the, uh, the officers and I think also a local disc jockey. And it was, you know, it was interesting. And with the, 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 bad, the bad guy that got hit with a single, you know, Pella double up buck, he's actually on, you know, record as saying, well, what happened when they shot you? And it's like, well, it just made me mad as hell. And I think that's one of the important lessons of Newhall is, is how hardcore the really bad, bad guys can be. I mean, the bad guys had literally been out shooting and practicing that day that the, the shooting occurred. So I think most of us have come out of a class or off a trip to the range and everything's just, you know, kind of spun up and you're like dialed in. And that's how those guys, how the bad guys were the night that they were stopped by the California Highway Patrol. I think the other thing that's important was that they had, you know, planned this thing out in advance. Uh, they had both done some pretty hard time in the federal system, you know, served at Alcatraz and Leavenworth, that sort of thing. And they had made a decision before they ever got to that night that they were not going back to prison. So, you know, they were just looking for the opportunity and when the officer reached down with the, you know, the, basically the shotgun in one hand, the barrel pointed up and the officer's left hand occupying the door handle, they knew exactly what they meant. that meant. And, and realistically, when the officers approached the car without having control of both suspects, when they didn't use good contact cover, the, the bad guys knew exactly what was going on and were able to identify that this was the chance that they were looking for. Eric, anything on the incident itself? No. Other than it's, you know, it's, again, it's what led to a lot of the tactics. It led to how we deal with high-risk incidents. Started driving the high-risk vehicle stop tactics, which were originally known as felony stops quite a while. It's another of, of there is a reason why we do what we do and why we handle things the way we handle them. Uh, for those not familiar geographically with the Southern California area, Newhall is where Magic Mountain is. It's north of Los Angeles proper. It's up over the hill. So if you come out of the north end of the San Fernando Valley, um, you'll drop up and over the hill into Castaic, New Hall, that area. Um, the location is now, I think, the parking lot of the gas station. I went there, went looking for it uh, several years ago. I think I managed to finally find it. If, if I could, you know, we were talking about, you know, not learning the lessons of the past. I visited the site in 2008, right? God bless my wife, you know, me dragging along her to these, all these different locations. I had no idea where to go. So I called the local substation of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department because that's who, who does police services for that area. And bless her heart, a, a young female deputy answered the phone. And I'm like, ma'am, I'm trying to locate, you know, I'm from out of town, I'm trying to locate the site of the Newhall massacre. And she's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm like, okay, uh, is there an old sergeant that I can speak with, ma'am? Absolutely. She put me on the phone with the old sergeant. I'm like, sir, I'm trying to find the site of the Newhall massacre. He's like, go to exit so-and-so. 
Uh, at the time I visited, it was the, Mar the parking lot of the Marie Callender's. Uh, the last time I looked, it's actually okay. McDonald's parking lot now. Um, but at the time I visited, it was the Marie Callender's parking lot. But like literally, I mean, this is an officer serving in the community where one of the most significant law enforcement gunfights had occurred. And they literally had no idea what had happened in the, in the town that they were working in. So again, we're, we're horrible at passing on our history and uh, the, these very, very hard won lessons. Yeah, there, you know, there is there's the Memorial Highway designated for it, but it's on I-5. The CHP station for that area has a big memorial to the four officers, but yeah, it, you wouldn't know it if you got to the parking lot. John, you said something very key there. Uh, you talk about we don't share our history. There's not a shared history amongst American law enforcement. You know, there's 18,000 agencies, 18,000 different ways of doing things. And while we all sort of get blamed for the bad stuff that one bad cop does somewhere or a bad agency does somewhere, there's not like a real shared, we all share this history. And people like us tend to focus on certain events, but to the run of the mill officer or deputy, you know, what happened in New Hall, California in 1970 is just not part of what they consider their history. Any comment on that? Oh, you're giving me a chance to do one of my favorite rants here. And it, it's, it's, it's worse than what you said. American law enforcement has the most ridiculous blindness to events happening around it. So not just historical events, but events happening today. It, I'm not saying that it was what happened to Coney County, but in a lot of agencies, okay, the agency next door, like in the, you're thinking of a suburban department with, with adjoining cities, they can, you know, one department can get into a huge gunfight with, uh, you know, suspects armed with rifles and, you know, oh my God, you know, horrible losses, barely winning, that kind of stuff. And the department that had the gunfight will change, but the department literally adjoining them geographically will go, well, that was something that happened over there that has absolutely nothing to do with us. You know, I'm, I'm familiar with a, one of the larger departments and uh, they had a very progressive firearms instructor and he had you know, was very serious about pushing out patrol rifles. Uh, he had gotten the authorization um, for the patrol rifles and they sat in the armory for years. I'm not sure if it was like three years or five years, but they wouldn't, the higher ups would not sign off on the patrol rifle program until they almost got a bunch of cops shot up. They tried to take down, I think it was a, a very highly violent Asian gang and they're shooting up patrol cars, you know, with AKs, with drum magazines. Unfortunately, they never managed to kill an officer but only after you've got multiple patrol cars shot up, you've got this huge incident. It wasn't, you know, they had the tools, they had the training ready to go. It wasn't until it happened there that they would decide to implement the program. So forgetting, you know, historical blindness, we, we have present blindness. You know, that, you know, that's something that happens over there that doesn't concern us. So uh, one of the things that just absolutely drives me crazy is it's not that we just don't share our lessons, it's that the people in charge don't want to learn the lessons. Otherwise, they'd actually have to do something about it. Eric? Lost my, lost my train of thought on it. Um, John, do you want to touch on the mythology about shell casings and pockets? And maybe I'll give you a chance to catch up. Yeah, so um, th there's a bunch of different books that have been written about Newhall. Um, Mike Wood's book uh, is excellent. I've got it on a bookshelf somewhere here behind me. And he goes into this... Uh, event in great depth. One of the things that he was able to do was he was able to get a hold of the original crime scene photos from the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. And uh, when I do my presentation, I was actually able to use his connections to get those uh, crime scene photos myself. You know, one of the mythologies was that when I think it was Officer Pence who was tucked down behind the car trying to get his revolver reloaded, one of the mythologies about Newhall was that he had put brass in his pockets. And everybody said, well, that's just a, a great example of you'll train as you'll fight. Uh, they tell the stories of the manicured PPC ranges and, you know, not wanting to drop brass on the, the manicured lawn and, you know, get yelled at by the sergeant. Um, very, very clearly, there is a pile of brass there by Pence's position. So we know that um, he did not have brass in his pockets uh, at the time. Now, to be fair, there is another fight that Bill Jordan writes about in No Second Place Winner when he was with the Border Patrol. And in one of those fights, his agent, one of his agents actually did put his brass in his pocket, but it was a fairly atypical fight. We're talking like a 60-yard a pistol fight. So putting brass in your pockets is, you know, still obviously not a good thing, but almost a little bit more forgivable in the context of a, you know, protracted pistol fight. So, you know, the brass in the pockets is one of those things that uh, did not happen at Newhall, but training artifacts like that do happen. 
And there have been other instances in which officers have put brass in the pockets as a result of, you know, um, training for convenience as opposed to training for reality. Yeah, I was told that in the academy about the brass in the pockets. I don't remember it being necessarily attributed to, specifically to Newhall, but over the years I've heard it specifically attributed to that. Uh, one key thing to talk about here too is that the CHP guys were not allowed to use speed letters. They had to reload from dump pouches. And I went to the academy in January of 99, and I've told this on, on the show before, for the people that were shooting revolvers in 99, and we're talking, you know, almost 30 years after this incident, there was in the Georgia law enforcement qualification, if you were shooting a revolver, you had to manually reload two rounds and shoot them as part of the course of fire. And that was based on this new hall incident of you've run your gun dry in the middle of a fight, and instead of trying to get it reloaded manual with all six rounds get two rounds in and get back into a fight and that came out from out of this um speed loaders later uh, were adopted uh, there were changes in the training methodology if i remember correctly from mike's book all four of these guys were fairly high scoring shooters on the qualification course john is that correct at least one of them was a top shooter in his class he got, he got high pistol shot in his class they were also relatively inexperienced officers, you know, literally less than two years on the job apiece. Uh, the other thing that is interesting out of New Hall is that uh, this is just a quirk of, I guess, how people do things is that, you know, one of the things they tell about New Hall is that they had only trained exclusively with 148 grain wad cutters. And then they were ended up firing full power 357 Magnum cartridges that night. And it caused a lot of consternation. Uh, according to Mike Wood, the way that worked out was that officers could purchase for their own use. 357 Magnum and carry it. And apparently three of the four on the scene were actually carrying Magnum ammo. Uh, I think the other one had like 110 grain super veil or something like that in the guns. But, you know, being familiar with your duty load, your whatever you're carrying for self-defense, being familiar with its flash characteristics, what it looks like in low light it is a very legitimate concern that continues to this day. Uh, another great example, of one of those lessons from Newhall. Yeah, funny you mentioned that I saw a Facebook post by Mr. Larry Mudgett today, and he referenced that uh, in LAPD, they had to qualify at least twice a year with actual 357 Magnum ammo because there was an incident where you know, LAPD reloaded all of its own training ammo. It was like 148 ground wide cutters over, I think he said 3.5 grains of bullseye. And they had an incident where the officer who had only shot the 148 grain wide cutters in training fired one shot at a suspect and then just stopped. And when they asked him why he stopped, he said, because he thought his gun blew up because of the flash and the, and the boom from the Magnum ammo. It, it, it happens. happens. Like I said, that's not what you want to be trying to figure out in the middle of your fight. And that's a, just as an aside, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan. We were, I was discussing elsewhere the selection of duty ammo. Uh, I like picking duty ammo that I can get a pretty good surrogate load for. You know, uh, uh, we, we're carrying 147 grain HST and federal makes 147 grain full metal jacket load. That's, a, you know, ballistically identical to that load. So uh, just something else for the people listening that maybe not be cops, but need to be thinking about. Eric? One of, so not an ammo issue, but a procedural issue. And I don't believe it happened in Newhall, so I'm not even going to try to attribute it to that. But in that era, there were a lot of agencies that would do things like put a tape seal on the shotguns so that if an officer chambered around in a shotgun, it would break the tape seal and they would then have to report it. Um, rather than trusting the officer discretion on when to, when to deploy a shotgun. Now we're at a point where mere unholstering of a pistol leading to you know, some agencies mere unholstering is now a reportable issue by a supervisor sort of the officer survival movement that that had a, that policies like that putting tape shields on shotguns had an adverse impact on appropriate equipment being employed are we uh, at the same place now where policies about reporting and investigating things that i don't think any of us would by definition consider to be a use of force but are now being made a use of force by policy to put officers by review well, that's not just, you know, hypothetical. Uh, the Avini study that we both know and love, the ambiguous shooting study he talked about, because they had over 300 officers from multiple different departments. 
one of the officers handled those scenarios in a completely different fashion. They literally would not yeah. draw the gun until they were being shot at. And when they finally figured out why that department was performing so weirdly, because, you know, they would give them clues, you know, and the departments that didn't have the policy based on the nature of the call, they would draw the gun at different times. And obviously, you know, the more likely it was to be confronting an armed violent criminal, the more the earlier the officers would draw the gun, except for the department that required the reporting of the mere drawing of the weapon as a use of force. So um, not just something hypothetical. We've got the you know pretty good research that shows us what actually happens in the real world. Nerd stuff. <laughs> well, I will confess here. Uh, when I was chief, I did have the policy that if you pointed your weapon at someone that you had, that was a use of force and you had to report it. Now, if you drew your pistol or slung a rifle to go in to clear a building on an alarm, that was not a use of force. But if you actually drew it and pointed it at someone or went to a ready position on someone and giving them commands, using the weapons as a means of control, I did consider that a use of force. I can understand it if we get muzzle on meat, but if it's a true low ready where the muzzle doesn't cover anyone, right. I, I disagree with it, but that may be regional perspective. Yeah. Um, one thing I'd like to bring up about the, the felony stop tactics is that you mentioned earlier, unless John, if you want to jump on and beat me up on my policy for a minute. Dude, I work for an agency that has a very, very similar policy. And uh, what I tell my people is, dude, just document it. Yeah. You know, I would much rather, if you're in a shooting, I would much rather have a strong paper trail that says mm -hmm. you have drawn your gun and not fired it 25 times. Here's, you know, the dates and times yeah. in 25 instances you did not shoot somebody as opposed to having a paper trail that says the first time you ever pulled your gun in your field, you shot somebody. So, yeah. you know, I, I kind of see both ways, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the best ways to make sure cops don't do something is make them write a report about it. Yeah. Uh, we looked at it as a way that we were taking it seriously and we were investigating every incident uh, through the chain of command. But I don't recall any instances of any deputy ever being disciplined for drawing the weapon in our agency. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and with my agency, the problem has to do with, uh, you know, we, we and we pled for this. Basically, you know, uh, there's a generic use of force form that you have to fill out for any use of force mm -hmm. there's not like one specifically for just drawing the gun out of the holster which you would yeah. love to have because you have to go through the whole use of force report uh how many times did you fire your taser zero did you use your taser in the drive zone no i i drew my pistol to the ready and challenged the suspect you know it yeah. just you know it's uh, yeah. agencies can agencies can take a policy that's kind of in a gray area and make it really good or really bad yeah uh, i can recall an incident a go ahead eric now, we had a weekend of a policy at the start of my career where a captain decided anytime we threw a gun, we had to write a memo. I worked for a very smart sergeant at the time who insisted that we follow it for the duration of the weekend. The captain had great difficulty getting past the pile of paperwork to open his door the following week. <laughs> that ended the policy. Oh, we yeah. had a great incident um, back in the late 90s when I was working out in Las Vegas. It was just this, this crazy weekend where uh, there was a gang incident and there were shots being fired. And uh, the way we did it was we typically make notification to a supervisor over the radio. And some smart out got on the radio and says, I just want to advise that I think everybody in the district has a gun out at this time. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know, while the ghetto bird is circling the scene and the spotlight's on. <laughs> Yeah, I think we can say this supervisory uh, uh, notification made. <laughs> wow. That starts that supervisor's my hero. <laughs> uh, I, the agency that I started with had a policy that anytime a weapon was discharged, that there had to be a memo written by the on duty supervisor to the chief. And I ended up shooting a deer that had been hit by a car. And I wrote a very detailed memo to the chief. Of course, me being gun nerd, I wrote about shot placement and the bullet performance and everything else. And I sent it in. And like the next day, I come in and they're like, Williams, why did you write this memo? And I said, because it's in the policy. We have to do it. I was the only one in the agency, including the administration, that knew that it was in the policy that we had to do that. And I was amused by that point. Uh, yeah, um, I could see that. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned, Eric, that this was kind of the advent of, of felony stop training or high risk stop training. 
I want to take a minute here to talk about a lot of the tactics that officers are taught in regards to felony stops or high risk stops. Those are developed against people who are cooperative in a parking lot with officers playing the parts of the bad guys, and they tend to fall apart when they're actually faced with opposition. So, Eric, I yield the floor to you. So what was taught in the academy for high risk, well, back then it was still called felony stops, was better than what happened, regrettably, in that parking lot that evening back in 1970. But the plan was, A, have a plan, B, the primary officer would get down behind the open car door at the A-pillar. Additional officers coming in would either move up to the passenger door at the A-pillar or work from the same spots on their car. They would give commands, they would hopefully gain compliance from the suspect, cooperation and compliance, pull them out of the car, handle things one of two ways based on organizational philosophy, which was either put them out alongside the car or call them back to the, the patrol cars, handcuff them, search them, go from there. The problem was, is like we said, these, weren't, these tactics weren't built on non-compliance, they weren't based on opposed oppositional behavior by the suspects, they were based on the suspects complying. But at least we had tactics, and it was interesting because the same things that were taught in the early 80s were taught when I went to the academy in 89, were still being taught the vast majority of my career. It wasn't until towards the end of my career uh, that I started seeing different training based on non-compliance by suspects, based Techniques that would work with office when opposed by the suspects um, coming out and being actively pushed out. This is a historical you footnote. Hear me? The other thing, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah, the other thing that makes Newhall difficult was that at the time, uh, this was the original call was just a misdemeanor. And at the time, just having a weapon involved wasn't enough to trigger a felony stop procedure. So even if those tactics had been refined and available at the time, uh, the mindset was, is that, you know, this area was just north of L.A. This is, and it was definitely more rural back then. This is where everybody from L.A. came to go and shoot, you know, out in the mountains kind of a thing. So if you look at it from the standpoint of how that call was seen in 1970, it was a considered a low risk stop. It was somebody who waved a gun at somebody going down the road. That was apparently something that, you know, happens every day in 1970. And I bet happens every day in 2022 in California. So even had that tactic, you know, been readily available and refined, they had not had the mental triggers put in place yet that says, hey, we need to be taking this matter more seriously than obviously they did. But here's the thing, though, and, and one, of the, one of the officers got out of the car with his shotgun. So obviously yeah. he's saying something's beyond the norm here. Well, they had a brand. So the way it came out was a brandishing call, which is the waving of the firearm around. Um. John, I, I think it's in Mike Wood's book and some other places, but they talked about kind of the organizational mindset of the Highway Patrol at the time. It, and this is not denigrating CHP. My, old, my car partner in my last sit in the gang unit was a Highway Patrol officer. Um, but CHP was trying to do, I'm going to put it colloquially, um, kinder and gentler law enforcement, not necessarily um, intimidating law enforcement. And that might have been some of the thought behind why the tactics were what they were. Is that what I'm recalling from Mike's book? Yeah, they uh, they marketed themselves as the princes of the highway. And you know, one thing that's interesting when you start digging into the officers' background, one of the officers had come from uh, his whole family had been Greek grocers. Try saying that five times fast. And he was the first one to really break out of that mold in his family. And one of the things in Anderson's book he talks about was how he had very intentionally downplayed what kind of police work he would be doing. He wasn't gonna be out there looking for really bad guys. He was gonna be writing tickets for speeding and stop signs. And again, we, we'd recognize him now as an officer that meets uh, you know, the FBI's profile of an officer likely to be murdered in the line of duty. But you know, California Highway Patrol very definitely branded themselves differently. Um, they were the kinder, gentler, dare we say, community, community oriented. I'm not sure what our, our you know, current buzzword is today. Um, you know, that was how they were, you know, being branded, that's how they were encouraging their officers to think. And unfortunately, you know, Newhall Massacre is the result of that thought process carried to its logical extreme when it actually meets opposition. Um, 
unfortunately, at some point, and, and I wish I could remember when the terminology changed, but I know it was well after I went to the academy, we got away from a felony car stop to a high-risk vehicle stop. And it wasn't outcome based on sentencing. It was behavior actions of the suspects. So you have a brandishing, you have a shooting, whether or not it's a felony or not, if it's high risk, then we then was, that was when those tactics would come into play. And we would work multiple officers using using cover such as it were, firearms out in display, giving commands, attempting to control movements and manage one suspect at a time rather than managing the whole vehicle. Yeah, John, do you got anything else on you, Hall? Well, uh, those are, I would say those are some of the key points and the takeaways first. The officer safety goes, like I said, I, I talked, you know, I have a two hour presentation on New Hall. Uh, the problem with some of these presentations is, you know, New Hall is a very deep vein. You could, I could probably keep you entertained for three hours talking about New Hall if I were to go into all the subtlety and nuance, uh, especially, you know, if you have any interest in New Hall at all, I would point you toward uh, Mike Wood's book because uh, he has a very good tactical analysis of that. And interestingly enough, um, he goes into some of the background, the, the political battles that were going on at the CHP Academy, because they actually had an FBI agent um, that was supposed to be teaching them street skills. And he goes into some of the political machinations that were going on that probably made that person in that training suboptimal to be sending uh, instructors on the road with. So yeah, there's politics rear their head everywhere. If I remember right, Scotty Reitz wrote a column talking about how there were things about the event that he facts about the event that he didn't know until Wood's book came out and he read it. The brass in the pocket was one thing that uh, he always yeah. thought was true until Mike disproved it. You know, and, and it's funny that the whole thing still goes on today with and it goes to what John Drant was earlier is we have someone that gets in a position of influence and they block uh, you know, the information on the incidents and attacks that's being shared. And, you know, we, we, John and I had the opportunity to train with Larry Mudgett this summer. And, you know, one of the things that was talked about there was, you know, certain, certain entities within the LAPD tried to block patrol rifles being adopted agency wide. And this was even after North Hollywood. Yeah, I'm still envious of you guys for getting to make that trip. I had, been to a class down at the firearms and tactics unit when when Larry was still teaching there, but I did not have him for the class, so I'm still envious of you guys for that. As well as well, um, you should be, sir. <laughs> yeah, I, I I I know, I know. And when Kegel can lord it over me, it's really bad. Um, one of the other things is that at least over time, we have started moving our positioning on vehicles, at least in terms of best practices from the A pillar in the door to the back of the vehicles and working off the backs and the outside of our vehicles rather than up at the A pillar. Because one of the things I think we've all seen this is using the door at the A pillar for cover, either kneeling down behind it or sitting in the driver's seat and trying to brace it, oftentimes will devolve into, I'm standing behind the open door with my entire upper body visible in the V, but I have cover miraculously. And yeah. really, I don't have the slightest bit of cover. And the world's about to go really bad if the bad guy decides to go that route. Yeah. So Should one it... of the improvements I think really has been this move to start working from the backs and outsides of our vehicles, rather than trying to position ourselves between car doors and cars like the hallway. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Uh, you know, I hate to say anything nice about Will Petty, but uh, I think he's been instrumental in helping us understand the ballistic efficiency of covers and stuff like that. But, you know, going to one of uh, Eric's favorite topics, just human factors, you know, apparently when you actually look at opposed fights where that guy is really settled hard into the seat and using the whole thing for cover, what tends to happen as soon as he starts taking fire is he just gets pushed into the vehicle. And once you're pushed into the vehicle, you lose all situational awareness. And we know how that turns out. So, uh, you know, human human factors are, you know, a component of every fight going on out there. And, you know, we don't need to be setting ourselves up to be in a disadvantage uh, from known good facts. There is a video that was shot, I think, before Will started putting together his high risk. 
uh, the Sacramento, California Police Department high risk vehicle stop. And you see open doors and officers, and then one officer standing upright behind an open driver's door with another officer in the driver's seat. And you see what John just talked about. When the bad guy comes out shooting, you see one officer get shot through the open door and another officer dive back into the vehicle with rounds going into the window. And you have those very things of the opposed tactics happening on dash cam. Yeah. I, you know, we get taught tactics in the academy and then whatever follow on training that just don't stand up to when the bad guys don't cooperate. I can think of two galactically stupid things that I've been taught in regard to high risk stops or felony stops. Uh, number one is in an officer survival class, I was taught, you know, if you're the driver, open the door, use your foot to stop it from swinging back, close on you, but stay seated in the driver's seat, but roll out enough with your upper body to aim through the V at the suspect and give them commands. Still seated in the driver's seat. And I strongly objected that into that in the class. And the instructor's like, well, well, no, the, how else would you do it? And I said, well, I wouldn't sit here for if that guy comes charging back, shooting at me through the windshield, that I'm just a sitting duck. If my wheels are stopped, I'm going to be out of the car on, on my feet. And preferably, I'm going to be behind the car where you were talking about, Eric. And, and that was before I even knew any of uh, Will Petty's work. Uh, one of the other stupid things I was taught in another survival class was uh, we were doing a scenario uh, with sim guns and I was responsible for calling the suspects out of the vehicle. I'm walking a suspect back to me. I do have them stop, do the old reach back, you know, lift up the shirt so you can see what's in the waistband. And I see a pistol tucked in the uh, rear waistband of the of the suspect. And I start giving him commands to go to his knees, everything. And we, we form a contact and cover team and we go up and we get the guy in cuffs and the instructor comes up and he stops everything. He goes ballistic. And his suggestion was that I should have ordered the guy to reach back, take the gun out of his waistband and have him toss it to the side. And I'm saying huh. the list of ways that could go wrong. I just as Let's see. Excuse me, yeah. sir, reach down, grab the gun, and manipulate it. Yeah, no, yeah. not terribly right. Yeah, because, you know, officer number yeah. three that rolls up and is walking up that does not hear that command, and all he sees is, you know, the guy reaching and taking the gun out of his waistband, and he starts shooting. He's not wrong. Or no. she wouldn't be wrong. He's not. No. But we've got, then we got the dash cam video of, you know, officer number two telling them to reach back and do it. That, uh, and I've worked in jurisdiction well, where it, if you tossed a weapon like that, it wouldn't be there when the stop was over. It, it's not a question of whether or not officers would have been justified. It's like the show me your hands command. Yeah. You're going to get the guy's hands right now. He decides what's going to be in them when he shows them to you. Yeah. Um, if you're telling somebody to put their hands on a firearm, they're going to have a gun in their hand when they do whatever they're going to do next with it. And you're expecting to see a gun, but you don't know what's coming next. So maybe that's not the best idea with it. Right. Um, you know, it, it's fascinating the differences just in, in regional, right? So California would kind of have two different styles of high risk vehicle stops, one of which involves removing, calling people out of the car one at a time and then having them go prone or laying face down adjacent to the car. Um, and then the other involves calling them back to to the officers' vehicles and working with them from there. But you know, they they at least the pulling people out of the calling people out of the car and having them lay down next to it creates the problem of when you do go up to that vehicle because at some point you have to. How many folks do you need to cover the people on the ground and deal with clearing the vehicle? Not saying agencies that do it that do it are wrong because. I know one that pushes it, but they have a whole bunch of resources on the ground yeah. that a lot of agencies will never get to. You know, there are lots of parts of the United States that counties are being covered with one or two deputies, and they can't yeah. do the same things that agencies that are running 30 and 40 to a shift are done, or hundreds to a shift are done. Yep. And, uh, and you got if, different roads. And... Yeah. Go ahead, John. 
I was saying, right. and, and also, I think there's a failure for the different, you know, sections to communicate effectively. You know, um, most people barely shoot halfway decent when they're standing up in kind of a classic position. When you tell somebody, hey, I want you to, you know, get in this awkward position in the car and roll. And ideally, we're talking, you know, 15, 25 yard pistol shots. I mean, that from a position they never occurred to, you know, there's no plan for opposition because there's nobody that can actually hit somebody with that system that they're advocating. You know, one of the great things about working from the back of the car is you're more or less back in a normal shooting position that you've built that base of skill in. And the, the complete inability, you know, the, the other great one is, you know, like in, the, you go to defensive tactics and they tell you to stand one way and then the firearms guys are like, those guys don't know what they're talking about. Let me show you what to do. And it's just, you know, you would think at some point we'd be able to get on the same sheet of music here, but uh, hasn't happened yet. Eric, you were mentioning roads. What, what, what? Sorry. You, meant, you mentioned something about oh. different types of roads. Yeah, so one of the other problems is if you get into a tactic that's based on a multiple car front, how do you then adapt it to that, to that narrow alleyway, um, some of the very rural roads that might only be one car in width, um, some of the historically very narrow streets in some East Coast cities, right? So there's, there's more audibles that need to be called on this too, rather than just do we front them out or do we call them back? Do we work from the a pillar? Do we work from the back of the car? How do we set up our front? How do we get lights involved in this? There's, there's a number of things that go into the tactics that have evolved over time. Yeah. Yeah. And Lord help us if we get a multi-agency car stop in progress. Uh, for, I, I can... And... Go ahead, Eric. No, I was just going to say, and, hands down, the most frustrating thing is the fact that we want to rush these events yeah. and rather than slow them down, use time and distance to our, to our favor, we still see events on video playing out where officers are rushing vehicles, uh, forcing confrontations that they don't need to be involved in, um, forcing some very adverse outcomes that had we used the cars to our benefit in terms of cover, um, and use time to our benefit in terms of slowing everything down, we would not have had anywhere near the amount of negative outcomes out of it, it's not almost, just in officer deaths, in unnecessary injuries or deaths to citizens, um, and then all the money and criminal and civil issues that go with it as well. Yeah, it's almost like poor positioning is one of the 10 deadly errors that law enforcement makes. I think I've seen that written down somewhere. Yeah. Maybe in a book that you mentioned. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. And if you're an officer listening to this, Eric, uh, with his company, Cougar Mountain Solutions, has a high-risk uh, stop instructor course. I tried to host it uh, earlier this year, and we couldn't get enough signups for it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something we all recognize as a weakness, but nobody seems as willing to put forth the effort to address the weakness. So quick, so quick plug for it. Everybody's been to a bunch of active shooter training, mm -hmm. but with few exceptions, all three of us happen to know one guy who's been to two active shooter events, our friend Chuck, right? Yeah. Not a lot of those happen. Agencies are doing high-risk vehicle and pedestrian stops daily. Yep. And we're getting, we're getting some very different outcomes on them. And again, if the bad guy decides to oppose it, some of the tactics that are out there, some of the things that I've seen pushed, um, by agencies, by non-law enforcement, by traders with non-law enforcement backgrounds may be very problematic. That was uh, one of the things I appreciated. We mentioned earlier the Mudget class we attended. You know, one of the things that you know, Mudget mentioned, and I think it's a great credit, is that apparently LAPD is huge on pushing and training tactics on a regular basis. And one of the reasons that apparently LAPD does as well as they do is they're really big on controlling distance, not closing with suspects until they're in a strong position of control. And, you know, if you're going to get into a fight with a bad guy, you know, the average officer is going to be better served being in a 10 to a 15 yard gunfight as opposed to a two yard gunfight. And, you know, tactics, yeah. you know, really do set the stage for what, what occurs. And, you know, sometimes the bad guy makes the decision there's going to be a gunfight. All you can do is control what kind of gunfight it's going to be. Yes. Yeah, you know, our, our mutual mentor, Tom Givens, often says that uh, 
you know, when it comes to cop involved shootings is that the cop often initiates the contact, but the bad guy initiates the fight. And that's clearly what happened in the New Hall incident. So, yeah. Uh, Eric, any closing well, thoughts on New Hall? No, I, I think we've hit on everything. If you haven't read Mike Wood's book, please get it and read it if you're a trainer, if you're a supervisor. And that's a field training officer. That's a use of force instructor. That's a tactics instructor. That's a patrol sergeant and lieutenant. Dive into some of these lessons. See what's actually there. And see what you can talk about with your guys and gals. And make sure you put them in the best position you can. John, any closing thoughts on you, Hall? No, not this time. The only thing I just sense is apparently this is a plugomatic show is that uh, I use uh, in my defeating violent actors class, I use New Hall and Miami as case studies. So uh, you can get my uh, uh, two hour in depth take on New Hall in that class as well. All right. We're going to move on to the last incident that we're going to cover in this episode. And that is from 1975, and that was the Pine Ridge incident. And it kind of set the stage. Uh, Pine Ridge Reservation is in southwest South Dakota, right there where southwest Dakota and uh, southwest South Dakota and Nebraska come together and kind of near where Wyoming would also join in their and form a three-state corner. Uh, Pine Ridge is one of the most barren areas of the United States. It's one of the most poverty stricken areas of the United States. Also consider that, you know, South Dakota's total state population is less than 600,000, I think, now. Um, and most of that's going to be centered in Sioux Falls and Rapid City. Rapid City would be the closest metropolitan area to the area that we're talking about, uh, Pine Ridge. Um, in the early 70s, we had an incident that was really active in the United States. And, and people, folks, if you think that what was going on in 2018, 2019, 2020 was like massive civil unrest, you really need to go back and look at the 60s and 70s. And uh, not only did you have all the, the riots and stuff in the major cities, uh, you had the American Indian Movement, which was uh, uh, very active across the Western United States. And that was... Part of that was in Pine Ridge. In 73, there had been a 71-day siege of Wounded Knee, uh, South Dakota, which was uh, also the location of a uh, massacre by the United States Army in the 1800s, uh, perpetrated against the Native Americans. Uh, so then, you, you know, you roll on almost a century later, you have a flare-up of that same uh, emotional context. And I think several marshals were killed in the 73 incident. And then in 75, uh, two FBI agents are working the Pine Ridge area, and they are attempting to locate a suspect in another crime, not the actual suspect they ended up dealing with. Uh, they end up calling out that they're making a traffic stop or making a stop of a vehicle. And this was before the days of every bit of radio communication being recorded. So we don't have a recording of what the agent said. And there is a disagreement amongst the other people who are working that day as to what was put out over the radio. But they've narrowed it down that it was only one vehicle operating in the area. And folks, I've been out there. Uh, you can go hours without seeing another human being driving down a road. That's uh, very, very, very desolate. Um, they end up making a stop on the vehicle, and ultimately two FBI agents are killed. Uh, the crime scene reveals there are 125 bullet wounds, excuse me, bullet holes in the FBI agents' cars. That does not include rounds that they probably couldn't recover that like struck glass. Uh, does not include the rounds that were actually in the agents' bodies. The agents fired back five rounds. So we've got 125 plus incoming, five rounds going back outcoming. Now, the agents did have long guns. One agent did involve uh, deploy a 308 rifle, from which he fired one round from. The other agent employed a shotgun, from which he found a round, fired a round from it. And the other round was from their handguns. Unfortunately, both of those agents were killed. I'm going to turn it over here to John for further comment. Uh, well, it's just, it's an interesting fight in that. Um 
some of the, you know, there's different versions of the event, but some of the speculation has been is that the agents could have been engaged with rifle fire from as long as 250 yards away. And what essentially happened was regardless of when that initial, what the distance was initially, uh, they were engaged with rifle fire, wounded, and then the bad guys closed with them and delivered coup de gras with a 223. Uh, both the agencies ultimately died of wounds that were delivered from effectively point blank range where they were executed uh, with an AR-15. Uh, but in order to do that, the suspects, you know, engaged them with rifle fire, multiple suspects uh, shot, you know, wounded. You know, you see officers, you know, tearing shirts to render tourniquet. Um, other interesting points, I think one of the FBI agents was uh, shot while trying to access his long gun that was in the trunk. So again, you know, my agency learned the very, very hard way. We, uh, we lost an officer in the late 90s and we're, we by policy, our long guns will be carried in a locking rack next to the officer up front. And, you know, just as far as your takeaways from this, you know, um, having to fish gear out of uh, your trunk in the middle of a incoming rounds is just a really, really poor way to start a fight. And it certainly wouldn't have helped the officers in, the, in this situation as well. Um, you know, just again, you see the, the devastating effects, what's going to be a common theme as we go through these different events, uh, the devastating effects of introducing, uh, you know, long guns, especially repeating long guns into these, uh, what are essentially kind of are starting out as pistol fights, it, it creates for a very, very lopsided battle. And again, you know, the, uh, just the way that whole thing started out with the bad guys, you know, wounding the officers and then closing to, to execute them, to deliver the coup de grace. Uh, you look at the FBI research, later FBI research on how offenders work. That's pretty much their preferred criminal assault paradigm. You know, they're certainly winging, you know, we know 125 rounds that struck something. God only knows how many went whizzing around. Um, you know, that's a very, very common method. And, you know, something that a lot of us don't train for, which is, you know, absorbing that large volume of fire and still being able to return while possibly wounded. Uh, you know, it's just not something that a lot of us think about having to deal with. Eric? Uh I have very little familiarity with the incident, so I'm going to listen to you and John. All right. Um, it does appear that the suspects in this case made an attempt to clean up their shell casings from the scene. Uh, one of the agents suffered a, a near amputation of his arm uh, from an incoming round. Uh, there was an attempt by one of the other, the other agent to makeshift a tourniquet out of his shirt. So we know this had to be a pretty prolonged fight. Uh, there was one shell casing from what was an AR-15 left behind. That shell casing and the agent's 308 rifle uh, were tied to another incident uh, where a vehicle that was driven, we believe, by the suspect or was purchased by him blew up outside of Wichita, Kansas. Now, Wichita, Kansas is nowhere near uh, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Um, so the agent's rifle was recovered from that vehicle and an AR-15 was recovered from that vehicle, but it matched the shell casings from the Pine Ridge incident. And ultimately a bad guy uh, was convicted of the murders of those agents and is still in jail, as a matter of fact, or still in prison. John, any other thoughts on this? I was gonna, you, you had mentioned just the, the civil unrest of that period. Um, for those, those that are listening that like books, there's a great book called Days of Rage by Brian Burrow that goes through that whole process. Uh, um, it's interesting, not just in a historical context, but as we lament the, you know, some of the local prosecutors elections, the people, the same people that are blowing things up and murdering cops in days of rage, those are the same guys that are now getting elected to be the district attorney for the city of San Francisco and some of those other uh, California cities. So it, it's not just that this happened during the 60s. This is stuff that's continuing on and on. And it was just really, really bizarre when, when Lee started mentioning that. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, the, the, the same people that were you know, murdering FBI agents out there. Now their kids are you know, getting elected to positions and influencing the criminal justice system with the effects that we're seeing. Yep. Eric, yeah. Days of Rage. It's, yeah, I was going to say on Days of Rage, it's well worth the read um, because I don't John, I think John and Lee both alluded to it. The 70s were significantly more violent in a lot of ways than what we have seen, even though we're more concerned about it. The media coverage gives us um, an almost distorted sense of the difference. But you had multiple domestic terrorist organizations that were either based on ethnic, uh, ethnic, ethnic issues or political ideologies all across the country. Puerto Rican separatists, American Indian movement, 
uh, Weather Underground, Students for a Democratic Society, Symbionese Liberation Army. Um, there was another one out here in California that's mentioned in Days of Rage. It was putting uh, poisonous snakes in mailboxes. Uh, Synanon. A number of these folks. And then you get into the 80s and you start to have some of the white supremacist groups, such as the Silent Brotherhood, pushing very similar tactics as well. Yep. And, you know, history is cyclical. And people that don't understand their history are doomed to repeat it. I guess is one of the common sayings, and they just lack a perspective. Uh, I've hit on numerous times in past episodes, and and on this show and on other shows that I've been on. You know, nineteen eighteen, we had a pandemic that lasted for two years, wiped out entire families. Now, this that was the Spanish flu pandemic. 1919, we had massive race riots across the United States, and those were actually uh, basically in response to a fear of communism. It just seems like the difference in the last couple of years is that they're pro-communist riots uh, taking place. And, you know, I, I made a I hope a, for, is a foreboding comment that I hope does not come true is just wait till we play 1930s. And it looks like we're starting to play 1930s again based on world events and our and our current uh, economic situation here. So, folks, get into some history books. Uh, the only thing that's changed is which way the armies are marching. They, they went east the first time, now it appears like they're going west. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, I saw a great clip the other day, Lee, you'll appreciate it. it says, you know, those that don't study history are doomed to repeat it. Those that do study history are doomed to watch. Those that didn't study it repeat it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, and it's you know I never understood how Custer's armies, you know, the Seventh Cavalry could have been wiped out by just walking up onto you know thousands of plain Indians, plains Indians. Until I went to the battlefield and saw the geography, and saw easily how it could have happened. Yes, it's in the Great Plains, and there's not a lot of trees, but it's not flat by any means, not in the approaching direction from which Custer, you know, you just literally, they rode right up onto thousands of Indians like, oh crap, there they are, and got wiped out to a man. And, you know, politics has the geography too. And we're seeing the same stuff play out now that played out in the 19 teens and early twenties. And then again, in the late sixties and seventies are playing out politically in the United States again. Any comment? Yes, we are. All right, John. No, I, I, I. Go ahead, Eric. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, it's like you said, we're we're seeing events play out. We're soft pedaling some things. We don't. When I say the collective, we we don't seem to be willing to come out and explain why we do what we do why certain tactics have a valid foundation in that the hard lessons we learned, what the cost was to develop those tactics. And by not taking the time to educate the public, the communities, we, we serve specifically on the law enforcement side of this. We're doing everybody involved in this service. John? I think that educating the public that's willing to learn is hugely important. I think you're doing yourself a disservice if you think that these are benevolent actors that are just mistaken in their facts. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're seeing is driven by um, a view of the world that in my mind is almost fundamentally evil. And they don't care that, you know, um, we, you know, we as law enforcement officers conduct ourselves in this particular way from lessons we've learned. Uh, there's people out there, you know, people, arguably government officials in power that are perfectly happy to see some dead cops. And, you know, I, I would encourage us to influence those that we can influence, but also recognize there's some people that are, you know, have walled themselves in the ideology of, you know, this post-Marxist, you know, tripe that uh, aren't going to be reachable, but try to get to the people you can. Yeah, we're starting to see it in our area. You know, we got a prosecutor elected that's uh, just as you described, John, and uh, who issued a very infamous quote, day one memo. And we're starting to see very, very brazen uh, crimes, very brazen thefts. And 
that's going to inevitably lead to violent confrontation. And because it's once a sense of lawlessness takes hold, it's it's not hard to take those other giant steps because there becomes a collective responsibility versus an individual responsibility. It's no different than a sport triad. You know, it's okay for us to all charge on the field and tear down this property or for us to go running through the streets and tearing up stuff after an event because we're doing it, not I'm doing it. Well, that still is a bunch of individuals that are doing that. Yeah, the, uh, we've got a, you know, we, we have blessedly been able to live under the protection of a strong rule of law for so long that we've forgotten what it's like to exist without it. It's like a fish swimming through the water. The fish is not aware that there's water surrounding it. But it's, it'll become very aware of it if you suddenly remove it from the water. And um, uh, I, you know, I hate to sound like a John Bircher and you know, rule of law, this rule of law, that. But um, that's essentially what people are arguing for. You know, in the in the name of social equity, we just need to get rid of property and allow people to take what they need to. I mean, just the, the massive commercial thefts that are happening out in California. Um, you know, uh, it's not fair to the people. You know, realistically, you know, as these, you know, you know, they, they argue about this, but you know, the businesses are basically abandoning these high crime neighborhoods. So all these complaints about food deserts and you know, opportunistic convenience stores and stuff like that, it literally becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. So you know, these these almost casual decisions, we're not going to prosecute retail theft of this certain you know level just as an invitation to go and commit that theft to a certain percentage of the population all right eric so john john's right this yes i think we should educate everybody and I, as many as we can and i will advocate that but don't mistake that there are folks out there that are better advocating or openly planning some very bad things in terms of how they're handling the criminal justice system what they want to see done to law enforcement, or what they want to see done to citizens who defend themselves. Yep. All right, John, what do you have upcoming? I want to have upcoming. Uh, we got TatCon coming up later this month that I'm frankly getting ready for. Um, Ohio, end of April, beginning of May, uh, doing a big thing in Phoenix in August with Cecil Birch is hosting me out there for two days of lectures. You know, nobody really wants to shoot in August in Phoenix, but you can hear me yak uh, for two days straight. I think I had to come up with some kind of a medal or a patch. You know, I survived kind of thing. You know, if you do 16 hours with me uh, and then I've got some stuff. Uh, I'll be at Meat Hall Range out in November. Uh, the, the website, uh, the schedule is at jhern.com. Uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting some dates in there. Stuff I've got booked in there. I'm uh, Royal Range in July and some stuff like that. But uh, go to the go to the, uh, the the still developing website to, to find out those dates. All right, Eric, what do you have upcoming? Well, like John, I've got TAC on. Uh, I'll be doing presentations on research into ready positions and suspects behavior. I'll be doing a block on a block on broken or block red dot optics, and then a block on reactive shotgun down there at that conference that you and I are doing one on aftermath of events. Uh, Mid-April, I'll be doing a law enforcement low light instructor class down in Southern California. Uh, the website, yeah, it's still a work in progress, but I can be found on both Facebook and Instagram at Cougar Mountain Solutions. All right. My web page is firstpersonsafety.com, or you can also find me through that weemsguy.com. Uh, my next upcoming class outside of TACCON is uh, the, the weekend that splits the end of April and beginning of May. I've got three one day classes in the Richmond, Virginia area. The Saturday class of that three day weekend is selling very well the friday and sunday classes are not so if you're anywhere close to virginia uh, richmond virginia please 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 sign up for those uh, i had to cancel a class that was sold out uh, due to a blizzard hitting the location earlier and so my uh training and 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 travel fund is certainly taking a hit for this year and i will be at the royal range in august and i will be in the Kalamazoo area in Michigan in June. And then I've got something in Ohio later that's not published yet. Uh, but uh, please check out those web pages and the web pages of the other two uh, guys here and, uh, and check out what we've got upcoming, as well as all the books and stuff that were mentioned. Uh, I am uh, hesitant to put links in the description for the podcast because some of that I think is what led to the problems of the two episodes that the feeds broke on. 
Um, so just try to make notes and go back and Google those and find those. And uh, we have several more incidents. We'll probably have two more of these episodes, or at least where we cover major incidences in the uh, and the uh, aftermath of them. And uh, as always, we know that your most important asset is your time. So thank you for spending your time here with us.